Hello. Our story begins inside of Dooku's solar sailor out in wild space. It had been just a year since the death of Qui-Gon Jinn, and a year since the beginning of Dooku's journey as Darth Tyrannus. He was looking for more potential allies for his cause, and his navigator malfunctioned, which had him landing outside of a planet he did not recognize. Most of the systems in wild space weren't too familiar to him or the rest of the Republic anyways. Dooku looked at the navigator and noticed that it had a fried chip, so he'd have to manually fix the droid and then use it to get back to somewhere that wasn't wild space. He looked around the cabin for another chip before he got a signal from the cockpit. It was a transmission from the surface of the planet, and the transmission came from a civilization that called Zakul home. They were a nihilist people, but they also hadn't interacted with anyone in the rest of the galaxy in centuries or was it thousands of years. Dooku wasn't sure. There were legends of people beyond the core and beyond the mid-rim that had weird beliefs and a history that spanned thousands of years. He responded to the transmission, one that hailed him to the surface of the planet. As he was pulling the ship down, he detected a large surge of energy, but all he could see is what seemed to be a terracotta army. Thousands if not millions of droids waiting to be used in combat. Dooku couldn't believe his eyes as he sped down to a landing zone and exited. He was greeted by a species he did not know, and they showed him friendliness. The Count would spend several hours on Zakul, speaking with these nihilists and suggesting a proposition to them. He learned that they had used their military forces long ago with the Eternal Empire, and he understood that these droids were very powerful, definitely more powerful than the ones that were going to be mass produced by the Trade Federation and Techno Union. It was bizarre. A civilization removed from the galaxy was able to produce battle droids 3,000 years ago, and at that, battle droids that were even more advanced than the current standard. It was fascinating. But Dooku was looking for allies, and he believed that this could be a good fixture to a problem he was having. At this point, Dooku hadn't secured the Techno Union, but he had no issue believing that he would. Now that the people of Zaku were on his mind, he came up with an idea. With the death of Qui-Gon and Maul so fresh in his memory, he believed he could exploit the civilization. They had already revealed all their cards, and he would take advantage of it. Dooku arrived in a desperate hour for these people. For over a millennium, they held a belief that they could find people in the galaxy and they could create alliances, but it never came. These people were on the verge of turning on each other, and a civil war in Zaku would destroy their entire civilization. Dooku made a promise to them, one that, if they continued mass-producing their Sky Troopers, that he would return them and bring them to the galaxy they desired. They would be a part of a massive alliance, and it would aid them in whichever way they wanted, as they became a part of the wider galaxy. Dooku's words swayed the people of Zakul into his hands, and they continued following his plans. He gave them a very strict quota to abide by, and promised them that he'd be sending transports to their planet in the near future. They were all very excited and prepared to enter into this future with the Separatist Alliance. Tyrannus knew that he would need to play everything as best as he could. He wanted to trust his master with all of his heart, but he did not know how feasible that really was. He replayed the moment over and over and over again inside of his mind. Sidious said that Maul and Qui-Gon were necessary sacrifices. Nothing was permanent and no one was safe. Their goal was peace and justice in the galaxy, one without the Republic and without the Jedi Order. If this was true, then Dooku was entirely in. But the ability of Sidious to move past Maul like it was nothing was concerning. He trained and raised Maul for over 20 years, from Dooku's understanding. The Clone Wars weren't supposed to last more than three, which meant that Dooku would know Palpatine for only 13 years as his apprentice. In other words, if Sidious could get rid of someone he knew for 20 years without batting an eye, then what would become of Tyrannus if he got in the way? Surely Sidious wouldn't betray him. He was instrumental to everything. First Sifo Dyas, then the clones, afterwards removing Kamino from the archives and of course killing Master Yaddle. He made himself invaluable, but perhaps Maul once thought the same of himself. The following nine years would go just the same. Dooku would never make any mention of the people from Zakul or the Super Troopers to Sidious. These droids would be the perfect weapons against the clones and against any unforeseen threats. Tyrannus also noted that chances are, once he released these droids, the galaxy would change. Palpatine kept a tight leash on Dooku, and unveiling such a weapon would unnerve Sidious. Also, one thing Tyrannus was entirely sure of was that these Sakul Sky Troopers outnumbered the amount of B-1 battle droids produced by the CIS. This was very imperative to his plan. Dooku's alliance with the Zakul was one that he held in his back pocket, and he very intentionally gaslit them into believing he was more focused on them. Due to them not being in and around galactic circles, 
he did a little tug and pull. He'd give attention to them, and then pull it away. They'd crave his acknowledgement, and then he'd send them someone else, like Ventress for example. Dooku did this to keep them on edge and be extra loyal to him. This desire for them had them moving to reconstruct a space weapon so that they could earn more favorability with Dooku, because Tyrannus was very adamant that he would take care of them no matter what. And for the people trying to make a change for the first time in over a millennia, the offer felt too good to pass up. Dooku knew their desperation would be key to exploiting them. The Clone Wars eventually rolled around and Dooku had since furthered the Sky Troopers into his back pocket. He had taken up loyalty to Sidious unlike ever before. He tried numerous times with new students, with trying to bring in new allies to his side and it felt like it never got him anything. He was very happy with Ventress and he believed she was the best addition to his side of things. Plus all Dooku had to do was maintain the status quo and the Sith would find victory of the Jedi. He did notice that Palpatine had an alert to Anakin Skywalker. That was a pity, and Dooku believed it was a foolish pull for Sidious. Over the course of a couple duels, Tyrannus proved to be the superior duelist. Sure, Skywalker was 19 and 20 across these duels, but that did not matter. He lost every time, and Skywalker even ran from Ventress another time. Why would Sidious even try to give Anakin the potential to join them? Dooku did consider that Anakin was supposed to be his replacement, but in all honesty, he found that laughable. Dooku and Ventress vs. Sidious and Anakin was such an adorable matchup. Tyrannus could win that duel a hundred times and again by himself with his eyes closed. His ego had grown ever since he joined the dark side, but there was some truth to his words. The darkness hadn't started to erode his body yet, and he was much fiercer than ever before. His saber technique was unlike anything anyone had ever seen. He learned from Yoda, and Sidious thought the blade was a waste of time. Dooku would hype himself up, and then he would come back to reality, because something had to give. Asajj was getting stronger, and so was Skywalker. The war brought out the strength in both of them. Tyrannus was eager for his student to continue growing. But then, midway through the war, Dooku was tasked by Sidious to kill Ventress. He couldn't believe it. She had been a loyal asset, a Jedi killer in her own right, and like Grievous, she was a useful part of the Separatist Alliance. But Sidious could sense the strong attachment between the two of them similar to the one between Dooku and Qui-Gon. It could not and would not be tolerated. Dooku had one choice, kill Ventress. If he did not comply, then just like Maul and Plagueis, he could be replaced. There was no need for weakness within the ranks of the Sith. If he wanted to earn back Palpatine's trust, then he would do as he was asked. Dooku bowed to his master and turned to his console and contacted Ventress. She was in the middle of a fight and avoiding Kenobi and Skywalker. He said a couple coded words to her. Messages that he created after having found Zakul, so that a future student could be protected in case this ever happened. Essentially, the code words were in the Dathomiri native language, and they translated to, You are no longer my student, you have failed. So if Sidious was listening into this transmission, which he was, he would know that Dooku told her she was going to die. But the code that Ventress and Dooku agreed on was once this was activated, she would take every single reserve fleet to Zakul. She would then replace every single battle droid in those fleets and then take them to battlefronts across the galaxy. The Sky Troopers were set to replace every droid in the CIS military. Ventress had interacted with them a number of times, and they recognized her as Dooku too. So when she came with the fleet, they knew it was their time to rise up. Ventress faked her death, because she knew that under this particular protocol, Dooku would have the CIS units target her and try to kill her. In a way, Dooku was able to test the loyalty and skill of a student, because the entire fleet present with Ventress turned against her and she was forced to escape under duress. But she was able to manage on her own and break free from the Separatist fleet and make her way to the Mustafar system. The reserve fleets moved around a lot, because they had to avoid running into Republic intelligence. There were individuals that Palpatine could not control, but he did know their locations. So this massive fleet here at Mustafar system would be taken from Nur all the way to Zagul, where they wouldn't be seen by anyone. Asajj knew her orders. Every single droid was to be replaced. This was also an assurance to be sure that these Sky Troopers could handle taking down battle droids. Everything was a task, and it was designed to be that way. Dooku didn't want Palpatine to gain a single upper hand on him if it came time to use his plan. Ventress landed on the surface of Zakul and informed the people that their time had come. She had been with them before, and she knew what words to use to get them excited, and she did that again here. She hyped up their rise to the galaxy and the people prepared for their first time to shine in centuries. 
their battle droids were shipped off to the Separatist fleet, and immediately given their orders. The people of Zakul also gave Asajj the commands to the control army. Despite the size of the reserve fleet, they didn't have enough room to store everything. Ventress knew this would likely happen, so she prepared to move this fleet along the outer edge of Separatist territory. There were also a number of scientists from Zakul that she would bring with her as she did this. But there was also one more gift from their lovely allies. Asajj was also gifted an ancient vessel called the Gravestone. It was a powerhouse of a ship, and it was used to decimate fleets in the olden days. Now it could be used here, once again, to do the same deed. The ship had been destroyed in the olden days and was rebuilt. Ventress was gifted the ship and told that Dooku's promise was one they looked forward to feeling every day. She smiled and told them that Lord Tyrannus was eager to bring them to the forefront of the galaxy for their efforts in leading the people to freedoms not seen in generations. Over the following weeks, Ventress would take over Separatist factories, place new scientists and engineers, destroy B1, B2, and several other Separatist battle droid variants, and move to the next location. Dooku was well aware of this because Ventress activated a signal once she began. However, neither of them expected to have so many droids. The army that was created had thousands of years to grow, and it just continued growing. New units were slowly deposited to the frontline facilities, and even high target locations. But none of them saw the battlefront. They were simply being stationed for the sole purpose of winning the war once the ruse was up. Inversely, Sidious knew that something was going on. He wasn't dumb enough to act like nothing was happening. He just wasn't sure what it was. Palpatine could tell that there were changes happening in the galaxy around him, and he could tell that Dooku lied to him. However, Palpatine played it off like he didn't. This wasn't him being ignorant. Instead, he was preparing to get rid of Dooku. Palpatine had a new replacement ready to go, and he was waiting for the proper moment to strike. Sidious wanted Dooku to be killed on the battlefield by Skywalker. It would aid his own rise to power as Emperor. Because if Anakin was responsible for Dooku's death, then he would be even more favored by the people across the Republic. Obviously, this meant that Sidious had to work with his new ambassador for the Separatists and Grievous, but he would make do with it. With Dooku gone, the war would come to a close, and he could become Emperor sooner than later. Palpatine planned out everything so meticulously that every potential comeuppance, like this, could be adjusted to without having the stress over it. That's what he did here. He simply adjusted how he was going to play things. Sidious just waited for the proper location to send Dooku to. He would die, but he had to die on Sidious' terms. The Dark Lord kept an eye out on the galaxy, trying to figure out where the dupe was. But that was the biggest issue. He couldn't exactly figure out where Dooku was playing him. Sidious searched rigorously, but before he could find it, he prepared to have Dooku killed. Both Dooku and Palpatine knew that the other was preparing for something to undermine the other, but to what extent, they weren't sure. It was a lot of cat and mouse, but Sidious was able to lure Dooku to a location he wanted him dead at. But Dooku wasn't going to be fooled. He was prepared. He knew this was what Sidious wanted. The Sky Troopers were prepared for battle, but they would be held in reserve. They were to be brought down once the duel began. Ventress was also here with them on the planet for when the Sky Troopers would be used. Dooku allowed the first several waves of B1s to go into combat. The typical procedure, Skywalker and Kenobi working hand in hand with each other, as per usual. They cut down battle droids and nothing seemed out of place for them. Their objective was find and kill Dooku. The two Jedi cut through the battle droids and made their way for the end of the lines. Ahsoka was trailing behind with a handful of clones with her. Dooku watched the battlefield sway into the command of the Republic forces, and he smiled before standing up and releasing the first wave of B2 battle droids. The Republic reacted just as they did any other time these monstrosities entered the fray. The Jedi took point, blah blah blah. Dooku just smiled sinisterly. It would all come crashing down on them. He was just so eager for it to happen. He stepped out of his contraption and ignited his lightsaber, just as a means of revealing himself to the Jedi. They spotted Dooku from the other side of the fight, and they charged. With his hand raised in the air, he contacted Ventress that her time would be upon them. This entire battle was meant to be a trap. There was a stalemate over the orbit of the planet between the Separatists and the Republic forces. It wouldn't be a stalemate for long, though. The Jedi broke through the front lines and got to Dooku and started to surround him. They raised their blades and told him to surrender, and he smiled, telling them that they were unwise to lower the defenses as he lunged at them. His lightsaber sped forward as he swung, blocked and parrying. Ahsoka, Anakin, and Obi-Wan were mixing it up as clones continued forward to make sure the area was well defended. Then Captain Rex noted, more Separatists were coming down from the sky. Oddly enough, as they did, the doors on the dropships opened up and the battle droids dropped out of them. 
Ahsoka turned to Anakin and said, oh, they fly now, to which Anakin responded, they fly now, and Obi-Wan followed up with, they fly now. The Jedi returned their focus to the duel as the Sky Troopers descended while raining hellfire onto the clones. They had to take cover as the droids got to the ground and pushed a heavy offensive. Their armor was thick, like that of a B2, and they were much more accurate because they moved like actual troopers, rather than mindless drones. Anakin and Obi-Wan pushed against Dooku, telling Ahsoka to move away from their fight. She did, as the battle around them got even more intense. Dooku had no issue holding his own here, as he got a notification on his wrist. The reinforcements had arrived. Over the planet, a new Separatist fleet exited hyperspace, and in the middle of that fleet was the Gravestone. It charged up its weapon and prepared to unload it. Grievous walked to the bridge, surrounded by these new battle droids, and he realized what the potential of this new army was. He told the lead droid to fire the main battery, and it didn't. The charge sent a massive shockwave into the lines of the Republic Navy, and decimated its capital ship. The initial blast ripped through the Resolute, killing Admiral Yularen in the process. The blast followed outwards in the ship and crushed through support vessels. These included Venators, Corvettes, and everything in between. Grievous turned to the deck cannon and told them to release all the Tri Fighters and charge up the cannon again. On the ground, the clones learned that their flagship had been decimated and their morale dropped, especially as they watched their brothers get clouded by these new battle droids. Dooku grinned, thrusting his blade forward and sliding his blade through Anakin's dominant arm, before slipping under a strike made by Kenobi and kicking him backwards. Dooku soloed Anakin out, a moment he had been waiting for. No more holding back, no more patience. His only objective was to kill the prized possession of Darth Sidious. The Dark Lord would have to learn with his failures before everything else crumbled down on top of him. Anakin stumbled backwards before he heard Rex's voice in agony. From the corner of his eye, he could see Ahsoka holding Rex up and pulling him away from the Sky Troopers before he was domed in the helmet. The panic in Ahsoka's eyes made waves into his own heart. Anakin tried to channel the dark side, but he was far too inexperienced this early into the war to handle what was coming. Dooku spun under Anakin, dropping his lightsaber and catching it in the other hand as he dragged it across Anakin's chest. He thrusted his hands forward, sending out a burst of electricity. It covered Anakin and he slammed into the dirt. Obi-Wan looked to Dooku and they locked eyes, before Obi-Wan ran past him to get to his student. Asajj landed behind Dooku as Kenobi ran by. He turned to her and, almost in a whisper under the sound of the battle around them, he told her to kill the Padawan. This fight was won. The clones could be heard running away and crying out for reinforcements, but they weren't coming. The fleet was now gone. No one was answering their pleas for help. Asajj would hunt the Padawan and make sure she was dealt with. Dooku, on the other hand, walked towards Kenobi, who was holding a student in his arms. Qui-Gon died in his arms and now Anakin too. He was heartbroken and wishing that it was him instead of Anakin. Dooku told Obi-Wan that he should have joined on Genosis, but it was too late for that now. He could only see what he could have had. Obi-Wan turned with anger in his eyes and told Dooku that this wasn't victory, it was villainy. Dooku smiled with a chuckle and told Obi-Wan that he didn't understand true villainy. He served Darth Sidious and the Republic. He told him on Genosis, the Sith control everything. Palpatine was Sidious. He called Obi-Wan a fool for not seeing it. What a tragedy Qui-Gon didn't teach him everything. It's a shame too. Kenobi would have made a fine student. He looked up and just as Dooku killed Master Yaddle, he brought peace to Obi-Wan Kenobi with one final strike. Dooku turned his head to see Asajj strike down Ahsoka, before he turned back and made his way to his solar sailor and lifted off. Grievous informed him that they found victory, and the new Dark Lord told Grievous to prepare to move out again. The death of Skywalker, Kenobi, and Tano would make headlines galaxy-wide. Fear began to set in. Was Palpatine the right leader? Were they ever going to escape this stalemate? What would become of their Republic? This death didn't just tell the galaxy that the war wasn't in their favor, it told the galaxy that their chances of survival were slim to none. The only reason anyone knew about this is because Asajj Ventress showed the carnage of the battle, informing the Republic that this is what the war cost. Clones were slaughtered mercilessly, and the Separatists defended the people of this planet from their carnage. It was a Separatist propaganda pop-up. It ended with suggesting that Palpatine was a war criminal, and he should face proper punishment once the Separatists reached Coruscant. The Separatist fight was for freedom. In other words, everything the Republic said it was doing. The best part about this little pop-up is that no one knew that the Sky Troopers were real. B1s and B2s, which have been associated with the war effort, were shown in the background, not Sky Troopers. Ventress spoke with pride, and she promoted the image of the CIS movement, one of freedom from corporate greed and free from the enslavement of the Republic. 
Such enslavements were highlighted by the child soldiers fighting their war. Palpatine was furious. He hadn't ever been filled with so much rage. But this was a loose cannon. Someone like Dooku couldn't be allowed to tarnish his reputation, kill his future pupil, and upend his war effort. So Sidious called out to every Separatist command stationed and issued out Executive Order 99. This would turn all the droids against their Separatist leaders. But there was one issue. None of these droids, not the B1s or B2s, not the commandos or magna guards, not a single one of them would stand the chance. Their little revolution began with a puff of smoke. D1s may have had massive numbers, but not even their numbers compared to the Sky Troopers. So while the Separatists continued pushing their offensive, they had a miniature civil war. Because their units were all battle droids, it didn't do anything to Separatist morale. Sure, the Separatist Council was killed, but who cares about them? They weren't needed for the continuation of this plan. All that was needed was victory, and they weren't meant to see the sunrise of a Separatist victory. They were placeholders for a future council that Dooku actually wanted, and with his Sky Troopers manning not just every vessel but every tank and weapon of mass destruction, he didn't need to worry about what they could or could not offer. The Clone Wars continued and morale of the Republic continued to descend. They were getting crushed in battle after battle. Clones on the front lines were forced in their positioning. Only silver lining in any of this is that the Separatists didn't mass produce the Gravestone, but it was their most protected vessel. It had no issue ripping through any Republic fleet it came across. And instead of Grievous failing like he had with the Malevolence, Dooku and Ventress manned the super weapon. However, there was an issue brewing. Dooku had used his little gaslighting trick long enough on the people of Zakun. They told Dooku that they wanted their proper representation in the galaxy, or they would turn their droids against his forces. Having just survived one civil war was more than enough for Dooku. But now that these foolish people from Zakul thought that they had some sort of leverage, they tried to make a move against him. Dooku wouldn't stand for that, and he told them that he would be by to bring their representatives to Raxus, where they could make their stand in front of the CIS government. Instead of going with a vessel of transport, the Gravestone and her supporting fleet arrived at a hyperspace. The people of Zakul program failed safes into their droids. However, due to outdated technology, Dooku just needed to block their signals, and that's all he did. He stood on the bridge of the Gravestone and ordered all battleships to fire on the people. To call it a massacre was generous. Dooku killed everyone on the planet. The entire ancient civilization was wiped off the map. He had no intention of allowing these foolish people to dictate what he did with the military they gave him. Dooku wasn't finished yet. He needed one more victory before pushing for Coruscant. Earlier in the war there was a battle at Kamino, and now Ventress would have an opportunity to lead a successful attack on the cloning planet. It would be very similar to the battle that killed Kenobi Skywalker and Tano. A massive space battle and an overwhelming defeat on the surface, ending with the cities being sunk below the ocean of Kamino. The issue for the clones wasn't fighting in space. Their issue was holding their own on the ground. Their droid poppers were iffy. Sometimes they worked, other times they just didn't. The training was good, but it was like they were fighting themselves. The Sky Troopers didn't walk slowly in a formation until every single one of them died. They moved with speed, they fought with precision, and they were unstoppable. No matter the counter the clones tried to use against them, it didn't do them any good. They simply couldn't find a way to seize a victory. There were some Jedi Generals that were able to provide a stalemate, but if the Jedi did that much, he or she would lose half of their unit. The price of a stalemate was too much to bear and the Jedi were forced into an uncomfortable predicament. Due to losing Skywalker and Kamino within the span of a month, Palpatine elected to have not just more, but every single emergency power, essentially making him the supreme leader of the Galactic Republic. He really didn't have any checks or balances on him, and so he enlisted a massive call for a militia fighting force. But there would be no point. Not because the fighting got worse, but because it simply stopped. The CIS stopped making a move against the Republic, and it didn't make any sense. Palpatine was furious. He tried everything to mediate the situation after Skywalker's death. He tried to force the government to turn on Dooku. He tried Order 99. He tried to get CIS worlds to rebel, but none of them would. The Republic was in a bind, and no one would join them. He sent bounty hunters after Dooku, but anyone who tried, died. They simply couldn't hold their own against the Sky Troopers, Ventress, or Dooku. But it wasn't over there. Because the Quiet was the one that came before the storm, the CIS forces used a backdoor route that Palpatine gave Dooku, so he knew how to get the Coruscant when the end of the war came. Palpatine used his emergency powers to pull all the forces back from around the galaxy, which elicited a reaction from the Jedi and the Senate. 
So in the process of leaving every other world undefended from a Separatist attack, which didn't happen because they stopped attacking, Palpatine was seen as too corrupt by the Jedi and the Republic itself. They tried to mediate his mediation, and the Jedi arrested Palpatine, bringing him to the Jedi Temple. The Republic tried to place everything back together, and while they were rerouting fleets, the Separatists arrived at a hyperspace with three massive fleets. Not just their main fleet, but the one from Keda Nemodia, and their reserve fleet, the same one that had been bouncing around before the Sky Troopers actually showed themselves to the galaxy. The Battle of Coruscant was huge. CIS and Republic forces countered each other, but the Republic was at a disadvantage. Aside from this being the deepest the CIS ever got to the core during the war, the Republic was out of position. The Senate was trying to move all the fleets back to their original locations, so there were ships preparing to jump to hyperspace, and the blockade defending the planet was behind everything, so when the droids came out of hyperspace, they couldn't use their firing line. This allowed the Separatists to move into position. Grievous led from the Invisible Hand and pushed a pincer maneuver down the middle of the Republic line. When it got halfway through, the fleet booked it to the port side and allowed the Gravestone to open fire. This blast decimated the vessels in the bottom line, crippling the Republic fleet almost immediately. Obviously, the Siege of Coruscant wouldn't end in the span of a few minutes, but the first 30 minutes of the fight were an absolute nightmare for the Republic. Admirals Tarkin, Rampart, and Coburn were killed in the first leg of the assault. It left the crews of the vessels unprepared for what came next. The pincer maneuver was pushed down again through the remaining center lines as all the heavy support ships moved to defend the Gravestone. Dooku pointed ahead and the droid forces moved through the atmosphere. Palpatine tried to force his way out of the Jedi Temple, knowing that it would be a target, but the Jedi had abandoned it. Not entirely, but they were trying to move a defensive force out. Dooku made sure this attack was a liberation, so only military targets were captured or destroyed, and thanks to his spies within the Senate, he knew that Palpatine was inside the Jedi Temple. So, the Gravestone charged up his cannon once more and fired onto the Jedi Temple, obliterating it into dust and ash. Sky Troopers dropped to the ground outside the Republic military complex and waged war against the clones of the Republic. The people of the capital watched in horror as their troopers fought to the bitter end. Jedi that weren't killed in the temple, fought with their men outside these complexes and in space, but it never got them anywhere. They were crushed, and the few Jedi that tried to board the Gravestone were either killed by Sky Troopers or gutted by Dooku and Ventress. As the Battle of Coruscant waged on, and more Republic military forces abandoned their stations to help protect the capital, CIS forces jumped into Republic territory galaxy-wide and took over planets with very little resistance. The most of anything that came from it were the deaths of clones and the few militia forces recruited in the past few days. When the smoke cleared on Coruscant, there was a painful ambience. The symbol of the Jedi was gone, the clones massacred, and people in total fear of what was to come. But Dooku wasn't here for oppression. He was here to make good on a promise he spent years neglecting. Due to his servitude to Palpatine, he forgot the entire reason he abandoned the Jedi Order to begin with. And now, the war was won. He could see that everything he had done was worth the effort. It was weird. It was like once he won, he didn't know what to do. The Sky Troopers were the most effective unit he could have used. The few remaining clones in the galaxy were able to start outmaneuvering them, but at this point it was too late. The war had run its course. The victory at Coruscant identified the end of the Clone Wars, but there were still people willing to fight back against the CIS. They just couldn't do anything. Part of the reason the clones were so effective against regular battle droids is that they had time to plan against them. They trained against them their entire lives, just like the simulations. But in the time between their first attack and the Battle of Coruscant, the clones were able to devise a single strategy to slow their assaults. But by the point of them slowing their dilemma, the Republic government had collapsed. Dooku and Ventress moved into the Republic Senate and informed the galaxy of their intentions. The irony about the Separatist movement is that it went against everything Dooku initially supported. He went against the Republic because it was greedy and corrupt, but the same could be said for the Confederacy. So instead of naming himself Emperor or Chancellor, he renamed everything to the Intergalactic Parliament. He told the people of the galaxy that he had a vision for a galaxy that didn't have Jedi or Sith, one that didn't have politicians groveling over the feet of their corporate overlords. The Jedi and the Republic sold themselves and their constituents out for credits and power, and Dooku wanted no part of that. He played a role for Palpatine so that he could eventually be a part of a new order. When it became clear that Palpatine had no intention of making that new order a reality, he betrayed him. Dooku did understand that there would be animosity for having started a war and fought a war simply to prove a point, but in time the galaxy would see this change as a necessary one. 
Due to Dooku not being a true Sith, at least not in his own mind, he disregarded the religions of Jedi and Sith and sent Grievous out to finish his lightsaber collection. Dooku used his Sky Troopers to maintain order, but also besiege worlds that refused to accept the rule of the Intergalactic Parliament. Most of these worlds were located in the Outer Rim. Dooku wanted to make sure he was very vocal about his desire to actually uphold a moral government, which was ironic coming from him after he destroyed the entire people as a ghoul. But he was adamant that what he wanted wasn't elitism. He wanted a galactic power that represented the entire galaxy, one that was protected and wasn't influenced by ancient religions with no precedence on the galaxy around them. The Jedi and Sith acted like they were at the center of the galaxy for over a millennium, and it was time that they all went extinct. Asajj did wonder what this meant for her, but he told her that they would continue their little way of life unless she wanted something different. In that scenario, he would not force her to follow his new government or his own way of life. Asajj had her own feelings and she was split about the entire thing, but she did decide in the end to leave Coruscant and go back to Dathomir. It's not that she held any resentments for Dooku, but she felt like she had served her purpose with him. It seemed like they accomplished everything they set out to have. Dooku understood and decided that instead of a Jedi or Sith order, he'd back away from politics as the parliament started to move in its new direction, and he would form his own new order. It wasn't really an order, but it was a means to help Jedi out who didn't want to be Jedi, and help them become something more. This little gift that he gave the former Jedi would be one that have a similar effect as the one he left for the rest of the galaxy. While Grievous still controlled the gravestone, he won and conquered all. The benefit of killing Jedi was he was able to enjoy the life of a victor. He didn't need to fight anymore, but he always found his ways. After the Jedi were gone, it was the Outer Rim. After conquering the Outer Rim, it'd be other galaxies. Due to his cybernetics, Grievous could live long beyond Dooku, and he'd be hailed as a hero of this intergalactic parliament. Asajj would find her home with her sisters, but she would still maintain a strong relationship with her former teacher. She would stay on Dathomir and follow in Mother Talzin's footsteps, eventually becoming Mother Ventress of the Night Sister clan. Dooku's little order of Force users wouldn't live beyond a generation or two, as it slowly died out and like the Jedi and Sith, found no permanence in this new galaxy. The Intergalactic Parliament was left to its own devices with Dooku stepping away from politics, but they took his threat seriously when he left. He promised them that if they didn't fulfill their mandate and their actual objective to the galaxy, then Grievous would come back and do everything over again. Grievous had control over all the Sky Troopers, despite working directly in correlation with the government as its standing military force. However, despite being the standing military force, Grievous vowed to keep his promise to Dooku. The tragedy for Grievous is that he would never find out that it was Dooku who almost killed him before the Clone Wars. Dooku would be able to retire away and enjoy another 12 years of life, watching the galaxy he helped form, as the Sky Troopers he brought to the galaxy the ones that dismantled the Confederacy and the Republic maintained their mandate to not just the galaxy, but the people of the galaxy. And that, my friends, is our grand tier story. Again, special thanks to Benjamin Wells, Jane Fett Clone, Ben Ingram, The Big Red Pure Mark, Diamond Constant, Lord Tib, Darth Nemesis, CC2024, Galvin Gaming, Tristan, Mandalore, Sir William1767, Darth Revan, Grandity Bane, Laliant, Sky Guy, Penguin, Cullen Rooney, Shark Midori, RJ38, Nick, Michael Erlanger, The Last Jedi, Apollo, We Was 670, Anakin Stank Runner, CT7567, Toaster Oven, Oz of Oz, Darth Nock, The Eternal Padawan, Joshua Tem, Johnny Daguin, Zeth Skeleton, Jedi Sloth, Mr. Yeet Gamer, Lord Cali, Gunless 66 Mammoth Studios, Anakin 003, Lord Dragon, Force Legally Star Wars, Airbus, Rex Wolf, Matthew First Names, Dark Saint 46, Baron Joshua, and Then Wing for supporting the channel. Smash that like button. Let's see other things, check out the Patreon or whatever. Otherwise, let's talk about this story. So the premise was to find the Sky Troopers and bring them to the forefront of the galaxy to serve with the Separatists. And I wanted this to be like a back and forth plot. I knew that technically it'd be a neutral ending when I kind of started going into this, but I didn't know how I'd get there, and I wanted it to go back and forth. I felt that having the Sky Troopers have more numbers than the actual battle droids of the CIS would be something interesting. They're sitting on a planet for 3,000 years, not really doing anything, so I wanted it to be kind of like the Terracotta army they have in China, but actually something that's real, something that can come to life and do the job it's supposed to do. And so that's kind of where I went from there, and that they just continued multiplying. And I wanted them to be a fearsome opponent. As for the gravestone, I wanted to bring that in as like a backup plan, but something that Dooku wasn't initially going for because he didn't know about it, to be a part of this ancient civilization as a gift to him. But I wanted Dooku's dark side manipulation to be key in him winning, even though his motivations for winning aren't necessarily dark side. So, I hope you all enjoyed, I love you all, spread the love, and always remember my friends, may the Force be with you.